All right, our first speaker today is Edward Delp. Uh, Edward uh, is a faculty at Purdue University where he holds uh, uh, several faculty positions. Uh, and his research encompasses image and visual processing, computer vision, mu multimedia security, communication and information theory, and a lot more. Edward is also a fellow of a number of associations, including the IEEE and the SPIE. So today, Ed will give us an overview of the current state of the generated and manipulated data, uh, Deep fakes being a prominent example, and will give us insights into where all this is going. Thanks, Ed. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank the sponsors for inviting me. Thank you very much. Um, so I, well, I'm going to talk about something a little bit different, and I'm going to make it a little bit more lighter. So we're not going to have a lot of equations. I'm going to show you a lot of pictures and some video and play some audio for you. I am sort of on the other side of this in the sense I'm interested in detecting whether an image or video or audio and even to a certain extent text has been manipulated or has been generated. This area of multimedia security, sort of media forensics, I've been working on that. My lab has been working on that for more than 25 years. And I'm going to describe some of the stuff that we are particularly doing with one of our sponsors uh, towards the end of my talk. But I'm going to start off with just showing you some interesting historical images maybe you haven't seen before. Um, so this is my lab. This is the Viper Lab at, at Purdue. Uh, and this is where we do all the magic. Uh, these are, I always acknowledge all of my sponsors. Uh, anytime I give a talk, this is all the people that are sponsoring research in my lab at this time. Um, and in particular, I want to acknowledge DARPA and AFRL and the Department of Health and Human Services who is sponsoring my work right now in image and uh, semantic forensics. And of course, this is these are the people that do all the work. I get to drive over here and give the talk. I got two of the workers here with me. Uh, a lot of these people have graduated, but I always got to show the workers, right? These are the people that uh, you know make everything work. So I'm going to start off with, what do we mean by media semantic forensics? What is it? I'm going to show you some simple examples. So let's start off with um, an image on the left. The image is on, in, is on, the, on the left is an original image. The image on the right, I've modified the background and I flipped the children's lips, okay? So one of, the, one of the things we'd like to do is given that image on the right, what can we say about it, okay? Now what you see here where the little X's are is the output of one of our detectors, but you like to ask a series of media forensic questions. And the first question is, is this media element manipulated? That's the so-called detection problem. Where is it manipulated? This is sort of the detection localization problem. You see the, and you see some false alarms, but I mainly got the lips pretty well nailed. What tools were used to manipulate the media or create it? In other words, if this was a, a solely created uh, media, was this generated by StyleGAN? Was it generated by... Uh, you know, one of the diffusion models. This is the attribution problem. This is more the, what I would call the technical attribution because there's another attribution problem you'd like to be able to solve and that is who did it? Okay, who did it? Was it a state actor? Was it a bunch of guys in their basement? Who did it? And then the last really complicated question you'd like to be able to answer is why did they do it? That's the characterization problem. Now, my team at Purdue is interested in all of this, and actually my larger team, I actually head up an international team looking at these types of problems, and I'm going to uh, say more about this. Characterization is very hard, but we, we are making some progress on that, okay? So let's talk about sort of manipulated or fake definitions. So here's an example. This first picture over here is an example of a manipulated image, okay? And this wasn't done digitally. So this is the actress Jane Fonda on the right, and on the left is John Kerry. Now, this image um, became widely distributed, distributed, disseminated, sorry, uh, when John Kerry was running for president back several presidential elections ago. This is a, a rally where J Jane Fonda, this is way, this is probably 20 or 30 years uh, ago, that um, purports to show Kerry sitting next to Jane Fonda. Now, Jane Fonda uh, has uh, an interesting reputation. Some people criticize her about some of the things she said about Vietnam. And the argument went, and it wasn't too much different than what's happening now. 
well, you know, he's hanging around with this person who doesn't love America, blah, blah, blah. And by the way, I'm telling you what people said. These are not my opinions, okay? This image um, has been completely, completely manipulated. John Kerry didn't even go to that meeting, okay? Um, you know, we also talk about the synthetic media, or now it's called generated media. We're interested in that. Then this idea of real plus synthetic, some people call that virtual reality, and what might that happen? And then what's really interesting is repurpose, repurpose content. So this talks about um, Seattle's helpless as armed guards. You can read the rest of it. And there's a picture of somebody running through, it looks like down the street, and buildings are on fire. So this was from the summer of 2020 when there was a lot of riots in the U.S. Uh, and the Black Lives Matter movement arose. Uh, this picture is from Minneapolis, not Seattle. So you don't have to use complicated AI techniques to manipulate people's ideas and put out disinformation. This is called, you know, disrepurposed content. So you can do some things that are really simple. Now, tools uh, to generate manipulated media have been around for a long time. You can have all kinds of interesting things like C CGI has been used. But it's also can be used to direct public opinion and blackmail people. One of the things it really is good at is confirmation bias. You see a lot of the stuff out there and you believe it because you want to believe it, because it enhances and verifies what you think is the truth. And so we can now the problem is we can generate tons and tons of this material that can really drive co confirmation bias. Um, Bias. And of course, it's easier to do it, and it's, and it's become much easier. I'm going to take you back in time here a little bit. So this is a very short history. So Kodak, which I bet a lot of the people, young people in this room, don't know who Kodak is. But um, in the 1880s, uh, they were like, uh, how would you, I would combine it like Microsoft and Apple combined as far as the leading technology company that sort of um, impacted consumers. And what they did is they made cameras and they made film. In one of their, um, their advertising, it used to say Kodak would capture the moment. And you heard people you know, talking about, well, a photograph, now I'm talking about a photograph. This is a chemical process, not a digital photograph. A photograph, a silver highlight photograph, some people used to refer to that as fossilized light. It captured the light, okay? And this is, uh, I put this in here because this is the first camera my, my family ever bought me, this old brownie Hawkeye camera, which is somewhere in the basement of my house. And I'm told I can still buy film for it. Well, here's some of the problems we have. The picture on the left, 1826, that is believed, and we can have arguments, to be the first photograph. By photograph, I mean it's created not with a silver highlight process, but with a, a metal process, this used more mercury. So this, this process could kill you too, uh, as you were taking the picture. So this is, uh, this is burgundy and the guys on the roof, it looks like you see the, uh, the, 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 you know, the skyline of burgundy, okay? Then <clears throat> about what, 14 years later, we have this picture, which is usually referred to as the first fake. So this is the first manipulated image. Generally, it's believed. Now, again, you can always argue. Um, this is the self-portrait as a drowned man. And this particular artist was interested in um, making a portrait of how he would look if he was drowned. And he get he used a very a lot of really fancy darkroom techniques to be able to produce this image. So it's it's manipulated. It's, it's considered to be one of the first ones. Uh, here, I just I'm going to show you a couple of these. This Civil War. This is a triple manipulation, okay? So uh, this foreground information here didn't, is not part of this image, it was glued in. And then you, Ulysses S. Grant was also glued in on top of that. So you start to see, you know, people were creating these images way back when, this is the American Civil War. This is another great picture. This is Abraham Lincoln on the, on the left. This picture hung in a lot of courthouses as a matter of fact, there are many courthouses in the U.S. that still is. It's a manipulation. It actually is the photograph of John Calhoun with Lincoln's head inserted. And this is a very famous picture, supposedly, but it's not real. 
So we're seeing, you know, more and more of this. Now, the people who got really good at this was the Russians. Okay. So the deal here was um, if you generally, uh, and this is Stalin, if you um, did something wrong, they killed you and disappeared you from the, from the picture. Okay. So here's an example of Stalin with some of his cronies. Um, that picture over there is the correct one, and these are variations of it. The more interesting one is this one over here, which looks really pretty good. Uh, this gentleman, I forget his name, uh, did something wrong, so he was he was killed and removed. Look at look how good it looks. This is a photograph. This is a chemical process. They got really good at this. Okay. Um, Again, this stuff has been used for U.S. politics. I mentioned that before. Um, if you want to know more about this type of stuff, there's a great book called Making People Disappear. And I encourage you all to take a look at it. It's a really good book. There's a more recent book coming out by one of my colleagues, Walter Shire at the University of, um, uh, uh, University of Notre Dame. It's called A History of Fake Things on the Internet. That book's coming out next, next month. Okay. Now, <clears throat> let's talk about the rise of digital images. There's the first digital camera, okay? Generally believed to be the first digital camera, and that's Steve Sasson. There's the first digital picture. It's his, it's his son, okay? Now, I actually got a chance to pick this camera up. It's not something you want to be taking selfies of or toting around or things like that. It's pretty heavy. Um, and so, so since I'm a matrix, I mean, a digital image is nothing but a matrix of numbers, then you have anything you can do on a computer, you could do to an image, right? So now you have this idea of the Photoshopped image. So let me show you some examples. And by the way, I, I should tell you, Photoshop was invented by Tom Knoll, who was one of my former PhD students at University of Michigan, along with his brother, John Knoll, who also helped with it. And I'm gonna show you something about that in a second. So there's, there was this early book that was published. It's called Beyond Photography. And this book talked about doing manipulations of digital images. And actually, they actually invented a suite of software they made public called the Digital Darkroom. Okay? All right. Now, what I'm going to show you next is the first supposedly Photoshopped image. Okay, this is what... Adobe says is the first Photoshop image. Here it is. It's called Jennifer in Paradise. This picture was taken by John Knoll. That is his wife, Jennifer. And you see how they manipulated it. They added another Jennifer and they added another island. This is Bora Bora. All right. So now I'm going to show you this picture because this picture bothers me. Okay. So what you see on the left is the um, Canadian internet jour journalist, her name is Amber McCarthy. What you see on the right is what a fashion photographer did with Photoshop, okay? Now, why does this picture bother me? This woman does not exist, but this is pub these types of images are published in fashion magazines. And then we have issues with young girls saying they want to be this. They want to be something that doesn't exist. And if you talk to people, and I have, that worry about things like eating disorders and things like that, particularly this usually is, you know, young women, it's because in some cases they don't like the way they look because they don't look like this. Well, Amber doesn't really look like this. So this person doesn't exist. This is I think one of the early sinister, and I say sinister, although the advertising agency is going to hit me, uh, hate me for this. This is one, I think, one of the more sinister applications of, of this type of imaging and manipulation. All right. Okay. So we've asked questions, you know, maybe we're interested. Is an image authentic? This is an example of a photograph, a silver halide image that people to this day are arguing whether it was authentic or not. So if you don't know what the picture is, I'll tell you. This is a picture of Lee Harvey Oswald, who was supposedly, and I believe he did, kill John F. Kennedy, okay? He is uh, in his right hand, 
He is holding the rifle that he used to kill John Kennedy in his left, uh, on the, excuse me, in his left hand, he's holding the rifle. In his right hand, he has a holster carrying a pistol that he later used after the assassination to kill a uh, police officer, uh, Tibbetts of the Dallas police. He's holding a new, and I'm, I'm sorry, I don't have a better version of this. He's holding a newspaper uh, in front of him, which is the Dallas Morning News, and it has a date on it, okay? Now, people have argued this picture is fake. Somebody else's head was put on him, blah, 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 blah. So uh, talking to a lot of the people I, I know had worked on this particular problem, uh, there's probably been about $50 million spent on trying to authenticate this image so it satisfies everybody, including high-resolution electromicrographs taken of the actual uh, negative. This picture was taken by Har Harvey's um, um, Oswald's wife, okay? So, you know, people have been worried about images being authentic for a long, long time. Um, here's another example. Some people say this is racist, and I think it sort of borders on that. Um, this is the OJ, I guess you didn't think uh, you'd be coming to a talk here and I'd be talking about OJ Simpson, but um, he was arrested for murder. That picture on the left appeared on Newsweek magazine, and that probably, because uh, I've seen the original, um, is very representative of what the actual booking photo looked like. And this is what Time Magazine did to him. He looks more sinister. He looks, he looks maybe like he's guilty. So you see that people have used this stuff already to sort of project uh, things. And again, this was not, this is not a Photoshopped image. This is just done with standard printing techniques. Um, here's one you can find on the internet without the yellow circle. It's a picture from one of our, uh, one of the um, things we've landed on Mars. And if you look very closely, there's something flying on the horizon, okay? And actually they did a pretty good job to sort of pixelate it properly with the rest of the relatively low quality. This is one of our earlier probes that landed. So now you can, you, then there's lots of other versions of things like this. You can go out and you, you know, there's a whole bunch of people says the US is suppressing all knowledge of, um, you know, what is uh, about things going on on the internet, okay? Uh, excuse me, about Mars, all right? Okay, now, traditional visual, uh, visual manipulations, which now have become known as cheap fakes. And by the way, I do not have a definition for you for cheap fakes. And by the way, I will not have a definition of, for you for deep fakes, but I'll propose some things. Um, use traditional ways of manipulating content, things like splicing, copy, move, and painting. And you can all do that now also with generative models. And we are definitely looking at that um, in our research group. So here's an example of splicing. Again, this was uh, from the 2016 presidential election. This is Rand Paul. This was published by The Onion. I don't know how many of you look at The Onion. You should, the lady in the back. Everybody should look at The Onion. It's great. It has a lot of fake news that it publishes in a very tongue-in-cheek manner. Um, and so this suggested that, you know, Paul was being thrown off the stage because he fell below this 2.5% uh, threshold. Um, however, you know, again, this image was, was completely spliced and it, it didn't exist. Okay, and the question is, there's a lot of people saw this and believed it, but, you know, can you detect the splicing? Um, here's this famous copy move from the Iranians. Uh, they had a bunch of missiles misfire, so they just copied and pasted them in. And they did a little cleaning, okay? Uh, this forgery is, you know, this is from 2008. So this is an example of a simple copy move. Um, here's another one. This is in painting. The, uh, this was during the Trump administration in 2017. This was Rex Tillerson, went to Afghanistan and he met with the Afghan um, government at the U.S. Air Force Base in Bagram, okay? Uh, and that's the real picture, okay? When it was issued by the Afghan government, this was what was issued, okay? And the reason why they wanted to appear, I'm, this is what people, the State Department tell me, they wanted um, this to appear that it wasn't taken at Air Force Base and, you know, uh, Rex Tillerson came downtown and met with them, okay? 
So again, this is in painting, and there were some other things that would change it. But the most telling thing, of course, was the military clock, you know, sort of disappears. So you're going to see more and more of those. Um, now, there have been people that have looked at cheat fakes for a long time, and there have been a lot of pixel-based methods. But more and more recently, there's a lot of deep learning is being applied to these types of problems and getting some, uh, actually some very, very good results. Um, there, here's another very famous one. This is the Nancy Pelosi. And will it play? How do I make it play? Do I do something here? It should be playing. They had a there press it. conference in the Rose Garden with all this um, short sort of visuals that obviously were planned long before. And then he had a, a press conference in the Rose Garden with all this um, short sort of visuals that obviously were planned long before. And then he had a... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip that. What, what happened there is if you... If you watched it, it looked, it sounded like she was slurring her speech, very slow motions. And that was done by um, actually subsampling the frame rate and then also doing uh, a sort of um, re reverse uh, um, a dynamic time warping to keep the speech so it didn't sound either really slow or like Donald Duck. Um, there are two of those Nancy Pelosi ones. They're still out there. People, it's amazing. Um, I watch a lot of different um, uh, news programs because I think, you know, I, I want to stay, stay up on this. And I, I saw somebody on this news channel, Newsmax, which is a little bit of a right, refer to this video again. Okay. And so, you know, you're going to see more and more of those. All right. So now we're, we're going to, and I'm not going to say a lot about this, but I'll just mention a few things. Deep fake. I don't know a definition of defake. Here's what Wikipedia says. I don't know if you want to believe what Wikipedia says, but generally when people talk about deepfakes, they usually mean some sort of machine learning stuff or AI has been used to make the content or manipulate the content. Now, this has been used all over the place. It's been used for fake news. It's been used for hoaxes. One of the things you're seeing now is this grandma hoax. You guys know about this, where um, an, they usually target el elderly people, gets a phone call. The voice sounds like their grandchild. Grandma, I'm in jail. I need $300. Send it. And a lot of people do that. And the voice cloning is getting better and better. And I'll show you some examples of that, some of the work we've been doing. Uh, it's been used for financial fr uh, crimes, a lot of uh, child sexual abuse, uh, revenge porn. We've. I, I was talking earlier. Even mundane things is insurance fraud. You know that if you have a minor accident, many cases your insurance company says just take a picture of your car and send it to us. But now they're worried that people are sending manipulated or generated images and sending them and asking for for reimbursement. I'll show you in a a little bit. Uh, one member of our team that's looking at. Um, how can you detect, let's say, in an MRI if a synthetic cancer has been inserted into that MRI? So we're interested in all those types of things. All right. So, you know, here's StyleGAN. I'm not going to say anything more about this. The only thing I will say is this website, thispersondoesnotexist.com, these images have been used. This has been reported in the open literature. These images have been used by Russian state actors to make fake uh, Facebook pages, and then using those for propagating disinformation. So uh, some of them are better than others. Um, and, you know, you still have to worry about, uh, uh, I think somebody earlier today talked about ears, and you also have to worry about people wearing glasses. Sometimes you can get into trouble. Um, here, I'm, I'm, again, I'm not going to say anything. Here's one of the first papers on GANs. Um, here's something on this first style GAN paper. And then this idea of looking at diffusion models. Um, and again, I'm not going to go over this because a lot of other people have talked about it. Here's an interesting thing, something we've been we've worked on. Uh, everybody talks about looking at using people, but here's an example of a slice of a three-dimensional phase microscopy image. Okay. And the one you see on the left is the real one. And the one you see on the right is, this was generated by a SP cycle GAN, which is a spatially constrained sp cycle GAN. I show these images to biologists and they get freaky scared, okay? Because they look very, very good. 
Now, we, we have used these for training nuclei detection, but there's another application I hopefully will get to, and I'll show you where the Department of Health and Human Services is worried about people making fake images like this and being able to detect them. Okay, and of course, a lot of the earlier work, particularly in video, has been face swapping, and you've seen all of these, um, you know, uh, faces swapped, this is, you know, uh, I'm not gonna play any of these. So you've seen these things. Jennifer Lawrence, that's not Jennifer Lawrence. And of course, the G Jordan Peele is a, a Barack Obama one. Now, one that I've seen, I think this might be a video, but I'll tell you one I, I'm not showing, it's really cool. Um, on July uh, 1969, in July 1969, Apollo 11, the Eagle spacecraft, landed on, on the moon. And they did their thing, and they came back, and everything was okay. Richard Nixon was president. He prepared a speech that he never gave uh, saying, okay, there has a problem. They crashed, or I, I, I don't remember the whole speech. Um, that speech, he never, he never delivered it, but a copy of that speech is in the National Archives. People have taken that speech and made a video of Richard Nixon giving it. And it's very good. Just Google Nixon and the moon uh, landing speech, and you can actually watch the speech. I'm not playing it here because I don't have enough time. And I think that's one of one of the more interesting. I think this one will play. Um, yeah. Look at the face of the guy. That's Robert Downey now. Okay. I'm not gonna, I, Oh, this is another one. This is this um, Irishman where they use uh, methods to DA. They use um, um, AI methods to actually deep, what they call them deep fakes, to actually de age Robert De Niro because the parts of the movie he was supposed to be younger, a younger gangster. I mean, De Niro movie, right? A younger gangster. And they use those methods in this movie. It's a, it's a very interesting movie. Um, okay, here's something else I thought was interesting. Bruce Willis, as some of you may know, um, is having some uh, cognitive issues right now. He's retired from acting. But he's granted his, lice, his likeness can be used as deep fakes to insert himself into movies. And there's a payment schedule and everything like that. So in the future, you might see a Bruce Willis movie where Bruce didn't really do it. Uh, another one is his Roger Stone. Uh, again, he was associated with President Trump and there were some accusations, some video appeared where he was supposedly saying something about the 2020 election. And what he did immediately, what he said, that's not me, it's a deep fake, okay? So you're also getting this attribution thing and that's why People sort of need tools to be able to, to look at these things. How am I doing on time? Oh, okay. All right. Um, I think I'll skip this side. Of course, there's lots of terrible potential in of doing this. Uh, and, you know, I'm even getting phone calls um, from, uh, from lawyers where people are fighting over money within families. And they're claiming that the they took pictures of their parents' house, of the goods in the house, and somebody used a generative AI model to, uh, to remove some of the furniture so it would be shared with the children. That's the level of things I'm seeing now. Of course, I didn't participate in that. Let me mention, um, DARPA has been running two huge programs in this area since 2016. One is called the Metaphor Program, which stood for Met, um, Media Forensics. Um, and this program was mainly interested in looking at the so-called detection problem of manipulated and generated content. Um, I had a team that, organ that did this. I was the principal investigator. You see, we had an international team. This project sort of ended in 2021. In 2020, DARPA stood up this semantic forensics program. Um, and again, I have a team that's doing this. It's a huge international team. You can see we have people from all over the world as participating in our team. Now, one of the things, uh, you know, some people said, well, you know, oh, we've heard that, you know, you can't detect, uh, you know, generative content. Well, all I'm telling you is we're doing it. And let me make sure you guys understand how this works. Um, when these DARPA programs, 
I'm not telling you we're detecting it. DARPA is detecting it. OK, DARPA has paid two groups to essentially set up independent tests, sequester tests. I never see the data that is being tested on. And we're doing really well. And how do I know we're doing really well? Because we're getting a lot of people in the U.S. government wanting our tools, at least our team. And there are other teams participating in this. So, uh oh, oh, so here's a. Here's an example of one of our techniques. This is one of this is some of the work that's being done by the University of Milan. It's on our team. And again, if you go, let me go back. Can I go back? If you go to our website, click on publications, you can get copies of all the papers. Similarly, uh, if you go back to if you go to this website, you go to papers on the metaphor. Uh, on both programs so far, we have about 80 publications. Okay, in this whole area of looking at manipulated generated content. Um, okay. Here's an example of one of our detectors. Again, this is one from the sequestered test. They did show us this image eventually. But again, these the test that DARPA is running is on hundreds of thousands, not millions of images that they collect and maintain. Same thing with video, audio, and text. So 99.9% um, .9 of the actual test content I never see because it's all sequestered. And then they just tell us how well we did. Um, here's another example. Uh, here we're looking at, um, again, we're looking at a beta version of Photoshop Generative Fill. And you can see where there's a turtle has appeared. And you can see where we've detected where this turtle is at. So again, we're building these tools. And again, you can read about them looking at our papers. Here's another example where we're looking at being able to do synthetic image attribution. In other words, this image was created using StyleGAN or StyleGAN 2 or StyleGAN 3 or which, um, um, you know, diffusion model was done. And so we have we have collected a huge test data set on both GAN-generated image and diffusion-generated uh, work. This is the, the work of Annalisa Verdoli, who's on our team. She's from University of Naples, and we're getting outstanding results on looking at both GAN-generated, doing attribution on GAN-generated, diffusion-generated images. Um, we're also looking at the more realistic problem of open set recognition, okay? You know, how do you sort of simultaneously attribute image to known models and, uh, and sort of identify those which for, uh, from unknown models? So we're looking at this big open set problem. There's going to be a sequestered test on this later this year. Well, not probably early next year, okay? And again, this is some work that our team has, has been doing for a while. Um, here's some also some preliminary work on looking at the generative fill that's in Photoshop. And one of the things we're doing is we're uh, Annalisa's develop a technique called no, no, noise print. Based on noise print, we can ex essentially extract a signature from the, the system and be able to identify uh, what type of generator was used. We can get a localization map and you can see the confidence scores that we're getting. And this work is still ongoing. There's been some papers that are published in this area. We're also doing a lot of work in looking at, I guess, what people call defect video. One of the tasks we were looking at is something called a person of interest task. So what we're trying to do is be able to pick a particular person of interest, like maybe one of these actresses, um, and then be able to identify if a particular video has been generated, both uh, the image and also the audio, can we detect that that's, that's happened to that particular person of interest? What would be one application of this? You may be, and I, I, and I didn't put it in here because I was worried about time. After the um, uh, Ukrainian war started, there was a video came out that sort of from um, um, Zelensky said, surrender, basically. Okay, of course, that was, a, that was a deep fake. So the question would be, could we then generate these person of interest models to be particularly look for Zelensky's videos or other uh, political actors, like maybe the president of the United States or other people, and be able to, to use those to be able to detect whether or not that video has been manipulated or created. Okay. Here's something else we did, which actually was surprising. Uh, one of the things we've been also spent some time looking at is don't worry about the pixels for a video. Just look at the metadata, okay? And why metadata? Well, there's been a lot of work in forensics and anti-forensics looking at metadata approaches. 
And we've actually, uh, here's the papers we published on this, uh, the, uh, looking at the MP4 container. And believe it or not, this works really well on doing, uh, looking at being able to detect whether a video has been uh, simulated, um, generated, or has been manipulated. And we got really good results on the sequester test on this. Uh, again, this, I'm just going to show you very briefly. We're looking at the MP, MP4. Now, one of the things you might say, oh, can I just strip that out, put something else in? No, it's very difficult to do. You'd have to be a really complicated state actor to be able to do it. Okay, it's not easy to strip all of the data that's in an MP4 container and then replace it with something else. You can't do it, okay? And I don't know anybody in this room has done it, okay? You guys in the back done it? Have you guys in the back done it? Okay, I see somebody smiling there. I was wondering uh, if they have already done it. Here's examples of some of the representations we've done. And we can even do things like um, characterize um, where the, what, what type of device was used and where, um, you know, what types of uh, editing tools were also used. So we can, we can write those types of characterizations. Again, here's something from the sequester test. This is the DARPA sequester test. It was run on thousands of video. And you see our technique, this is the RC curve. You see we did very well. Again, not analyzing the pixels, just looking at the metadata. Okay. Um, here's, uh, here's another view of that uh, particular ROC curve. And again, this is from the SIM4 evaluation 3.3.11. And again, I've never seen all of the video that was used in this test. DARPA produced this picture and you said we did very well. Okay, let's talk a little bit about speech. Uh, the most interesting one was the Goldman Sachs attack. I don't know if you ever heard, seen, heard about this one. Um, there was a conference call uh, announcing some sort of performance of some stocks, and somebody inserted a deep fake audio in there, and it, they almost made a $40 million mistake, Goldman Sachs did, but they got caught. Um, let me see if this is going to work. Um, so we've been doing a lot of work. Also. In all these lines, the facts are drawn together so by a strong is, thread of unity. In all these lines, the facts stop? are drawn together by a strong thread of unity. In all these lines, in all these lines, right, the, the fake. facts are drawn together by a strong thread of unity. In all these lines, the facts are drawn in together. All okay. This is sort of an overview of existing work in speech forensics. And... Um, uh, we are looking at methods that are um, a combination of waveform-based and their so-called image-based approaches. Um, here's one that we've done. This is a disentangled rep uh, representation learning for deepfake uh, speech detection. And again, uh, the speech signal we're actually using um, is a spectrogram. It's actually a modified spectrogram. And then in a sense, but not completely, we treat that as an image and then do analysis on that and de determine whether or not the uh, image is, the, excuse me, the, the speech is, um, is, is, has been manipulated or has been generated. We also can do genera generator attribution. We did a, we, we've also both looked at the open set and uh, closed set scenario. Here's our results of accuracy. This is using something called the ASV spoof 2019 data set which is one of the ones we use. We also use one of the sequestered uh, DARPA data sets and we got something um, about the same performance as that. Um, if you look, um, here's another me method. This was synthetic speech attribution. Remember attribution is we wanna try to attribute the generator. What was the generator that we used to generate the speech? This was using something called the patch out spectrum attribution transformer. Um, and again, uh, we both did both a closed set and open set this paper is actually going to, is this the one that's going to be presented next week? Five minutes. Not, nah, okay, we are, okay, we already did it. I got to go quick. I got five minutes. So that's sort of the Bach diagram. Uh, you can get a copy of the paper from our, uh, from our website. Um, um, here's some of the performance we did. Actually, I got some curves here. Well, maybe I didn't have them in there, but we did quite very well. We're also looking at problems of um, how can you tell if the image content and the, and the caption doesn't match? So we're looking at this is so-called image text consistency check. And we have a method we've developed from that. We've uh, submitted, uh, actually published a couple of papers on this. I, I'm going to go speed up this a little bit. Um, here's some experimental results. We're also collecting a lot of data. We're looking at practical di disinformation 
this is some work that our uh, part of our team at the University of um, Notre Dame is working on. Uh, finally, we're also looking at synthetic tweet analysis. Can we actually do attribute synthetic tweets? We've collected a huge data set of synthetic tweets using various models. We've actually scraped 20,000 original tweets until Elon Musk threw us off of Twitter, okay, because he changed the whole model of how that was going to be done. Um, and this is some of the performance. I want to show you one last thing. Um, one of the things that this particular sub team has been working on and it's funded by the uh, Department of Health and Human Services, and particularly the Office of Research Integrity. And that is, you've seen a lot in the publication and in the, in the, in the literature out there or in the news about people having to redact, retract, uh, retract their papers. And so we are building a system for the Department of Health and Human Services, and particularly the Office of Research Integrity, uh, to be able to uh, analyze your your image, uh, they can upload a PDF to this. It will extract all the images from the particular PDF and do analysis on it to see if those images have been manipulated in any way. This is called the review system. We've been working on this problem for about two and a half years. And we are about, uh, we have delivered a version of the system to, um, to them. Okay, and I wish I had time to do this demo, but I don't, um, but, um, the system has a lot of different types of analysis it can do, including uh, look for copy moves. It can look for synthetic images. Um, and, you know, we can we can even do things like remove the retracted notice and a bunch of other stuff. Uh, there's a copy move. I'm going to I'm going to go forward fast. OK, show you this real quick. This is injected cancer. OK, and we can detect it. OK, here's an example of injection. Here's the example of removal. So we've been looking at this uh, for doing diffusion models, also some GAN-like models. Again, they're interested in this because they're worried about people using, uh, generating all kinds of sinister synthetic images. Okay, a couple commercials. There's a really interesting paper, I was one of the co-authors, called Information, Secure, Information uh, Forensics and Security. It's over an overview paper of the last 20 years in this area. Um, here's a very good paper that Annalisa produced, Luisa Verdolia. Uh, this is on media forensics and deep fakes and overview. Here's a paper we did looking at deep uh, generator models for generating synthetic satellite imagery and how you might want to generate uh, detect them. Finally, this is some another set of medical images. These are called Western blot images. And um, uh, again, this was the paper we put together looking at uh, both detecting and generating synthetic uh, uh, Western blot images. I'm going to give another commercial here to Walter in his book. There's everybody who paid for this. There's everybody who did all the work. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. We have time for one quick question. I have a question. Um, in, have you been looking into uh, not just images and audio and video, but uh, scientific data, uh, I don't know, uh, files and formats and data that's uh, um, been gathered through scientific endeavor. We, we have been looking at in the, in the scientific integrity, uh, looking at the journal, journal papers, we're looking at data that's in graphs and plots and things like that also and see what, if there's anything we can infer, whether that the data is consistent. Uh, but not data per se, like maybe somebody collects EKG data or something like that, and we haven't done any work in that area. Okay, thank you. Uh, but but uh, I have a student who we're ready to submit a paper next week where we've generated synthetic echocardiogram data, three uh, ultrasound images of the heart. We showed them to a cardiologist at the University of California at Irvine, and she was really interested. So, yeah. Okay, I think I went over.